Thank you so much for being here. My name is Jennifer Purcell. I'm the director of the Future Ready Oregon and could not be more excited to be kicking off this work of the Healthcare Industry Consortium today. We have a packed agenda and so appreciate you spending your day with us. Um, and we're looking forward to getting started. We're going to um, start things off today with some welcoming remarks from the uh, director of the Higher Education Coordinating Commission, Ben Cannon, who is uh, joining us virtually. And, um, and then we'll jump into introductions and a little bit more about orienting you to the space and the day, um, but we'll be happy to be, have you with us. We have um, around the table, the Wi-Fi information password, if you need that. And restrooms are uh, just outside here. Um, and we have coffee and water for you as well. I think those are probably the most important housekeeping items. And so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Director Cannon uh, to welcome you here today. Thanks, Jennifer. Let me check and make sure you can hear me in the room. I'm going to turn you, can we turn him up just a little bit? <laughs> All, right. All right. How's that? Okay. Well, I am just delighted to welcome you to the kickoff meeting for the Healthcare Industry Consortium for Future Ready Oregon and to thank you for accepting our invitation to participate as a member of the consortium. Um, I, I'm so sorry not to be in the room and to be joining you remotely. And I have to say, it's pretty strange because I can't see you at all, but I have seen the roster. I have a good sense of who is there. And of course, some of the folks who are joining on the line and I am um, just overwhelmed and, and, and humbled by the uh, commitments of time that uh, you are making to this really important project. You're gonna hear uh, more in the coming um, minutes about what this group will do and why it matters so very much. Uh, so I will be very brief. And I think my participation this morning in kicking off the meeting is really intended to signify just how important this work is to the state of Oregon, to the Higher Education Coordinating Commission, how strongly we're committed to supporting you this consortium in your work and how excited we are about the work that you will do beginning today. Um, our staff has been involved, staff of the Higher Education Coordinating Commission, the HAC, has been involved in the development, was involved in the development of the Future Ready Oregon uh, legislation since the very beginning, uh, nearly two years ago when it was essentially a whiteboard exercise spearheaded by the Governor's Racial Justice Council and its Workforce Subcommittee. And we at the HAC take very seriously that Future Ready Oregon and including this consortium are really organized to meet, are organized around two principles. Uh, the first is about racial justice and justice for Oregon's other underrepresented and underserved marginalized communities. And the second is the principle of our need to meet the state and industry workforce needs. And these principles, these goals work powerfully together because racial justice and justice for other marginalized Oregonians can't be achieved without economic opportunity, without uh, workforce participation in meaningful and impactful ways. And the state's workforce needs can't be met without more uh, directly, deliberately engaging underserved and marginalized Oregonians in workforce. I wanna say uh, just a few words about the work of the consortium specifically. Um, your work here will help us to understand your industries, the healthcare industries, current and emerging workforce needs. But even more importantly, you will help us connect that information to investments, public investments in education, in training, and in community support that Oregonians need in order to be ready for jobs in the healthcare fields. And I want to emphasize, as I wrap up, 
that this is a different model. This represents a different model for how we invest in education and training in Oregon. Like most public agencies, like most services, our investments today are primarily a function of what they were a year ago or two years ago or four years ago as we seek to sustain and support and expand institutions, public institutions of education and training that we've um, created in Oregon and invested in over the years. But what the work of the consortium and what the idea of the consortium represents is a new model for investing in education and training, one driven by the needs of industry together with educators and community leaders helping us to understand the kinds of investments, supports, and services that Oregonians need in order to access these careers and these jobs over the short and long term. Finally, I just want to acknowledge the extraordinary staff at the HEC who have launched this effort and will be shortly launching and supporting our other two industry consortia for manufacturing and for technology. It's a terrific team and it expands, it spans offices across our agency. So Jennifer Purcell, who um, kicked this off uh, this morning, um, folks from our, from our research and data office, some of whom you'll, you'll meet over the course of the day, our Office of Workforce Investments, uh, staff who work with community colleges and public universities and training providers and community organizations who lead our equity and diversity work. Um, this is an all hands on deck effort for the heck. Um, we are incredibly excited to get going. We've put a ton of time and planning and resources into making this work successful. And if there's anything that you need, anything that we need to do in order to support you in feeling engaged and impactful, given your commitment of time to this project, please let Jennifer, let other staff, or let me know uh, what we can do. So I'm going to stop there and turn it over to other speakers. But again, thanks so much for your um, participation. Thanks so much, Ben. Well, um, as uh, Director Cannon said, it is a bit of an all hands on deck exercise. We do have a number of staff here today who are very name tags and you'll see in the further of the room if you need anything today, uh, we're all here to support you. Um, I am gonna turn it over at this time to our facilitator for the day, Lindsay Wolsey. Lindsay uh, is principal with the Wolsey Group and will um, give us a bit of an orientation for what to expect throughout the day. And I'll be back with you shortly to provide some uh, additional foundational information about Future Ready Oregon so that we all have um, the same working knowledge. All right, Lindsay, take it away. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, not used to the mic. Okay, great. And hopefully folks on Zoom as well. Um, so yes, um, I am here to sort of just be a guide throughout the day. Um, and in fact, that will be my role um, probably through the end of the year, along with a whole other team of facilitators that I will introduce um, shortly. Um, but I would like to direct your attention to some of what is in your packs at this moment, because part of um, today will be really sinking everybody into the context of what the healthcare industry consortium is, what it is intended to accomplish and how this is intended um, to work toward the goal um, of future Ready Oregon um, legislation. And so um, this will be an exercise in connecting dots and in tracking back to even a year ago, right? When you all and some of you in fact really um, neck deep in getting the future Ready Oregon legislation passed. And so take a look in your packets um, out a few things. First of all, you will see our agenda and we will walk through that and sort of the goals of what we want out of today. You will also see um, the draft consortium charter. This is draft. This is the kickoff. And so this is important to note um, because this is an opportunity for everyone to really, again, sink into what the goals and purpose of the industry consortium are um, for what the charter right now says. We do not expect big changes to this charter, but we do expect as you get into your working groups um, that you are able to really understand what it is that we need to be doing and does our charter reflect that. So as we go through the day and you will get a deeper dive into the charter um, uh, shortly from, from Jennifer, 
Um, but as we go through, just make notes of the leadership, of the names, of um, the very specific, you can focus on page um, sort of uh, two and three for purpose and scope. Um, this is going to be important as we as we dig in. There's a couple other things. Um, if you look at your agenda, you'll note and, and thank you to um, uh, Jen for providing opening remarks. But you'll also note that we have additional leadership that will be helping with closing remarks. Um, I think Chairman Cross is here. Am I right? Yes. Thank you. Waving waving in the back. Um, and Chair Mercero um, from the Workforce Board will also be here um, joining in the afternoon. So just make note of some of the, the people and the leadership that are involved. Um, and we also want to hear who you are. And so this morning, we'll just do a very, very quick round of introductions. Um, your name and your organization, particularly for those of you sitting around the center table who made up um, the actual membership of the consortium. Um, and then just note that in your packets, additionally to the charter and the agenda, there is information about each of you. And this is um, hopefully mostly complete, um, but dependent very much on who will be able to give us information um, to put in there. So that will give you a better idea of, of how you collectively make up the industry um, consortiums that's picking up today. So that was a lot, um, but I did want to just give you sort of a tour of what's in your, in your pocket. So let me just pause and introduce myself um, for those of you who, who, who may not know who I am. And I'm also going to ask um, our other facilitation lead to, to join me. Um, my name is Lindsay Woolsey. I work nationally. Um, I um, am co-principal of an organization called the Institute for Networks Communities, and we build industry partnerships. Um, in a nutshell. We build industry partnerships all over the country. Our model of industry partnership is in 20 states, um, and we've been doing this for almost 15 years. Um, we have very specific principles and approaches and concepts to how you build an effective industry partnership. Um, and we also have some very specific principles and concepts on what happens at a regional level versus what is the value add of a statewide industry partnership consortium, a la what you all are now a part of. Oregon will also have to continue to figure this out for, for themselves, right? And so we will be borrowing and we have borrowed already um, from what other states have been doing and what works in other states. But you all, of course, you know this, have a very specific opportunity with the Ready Oregon to ensure that the makeup and the points of accountability for the healthcare industry consortium very much lean into and achieve equity and inclusion in ways that perhaps we have never seen anywhere else in the country. And I will invite you to consider that this should be what gives you all goosebumps because in my national work, this is still the big question mark and very much still mostly in rhetoric and not in implementation and in action. So today, when we dig into our breakouts, very specifically, which I'll do a quick introduction to, this will be the lens by which all of your conversations should be inside of. You will receive, and you'll see in the agenda, information. It may feel like information overload, but this is very purposeful today to get you as much data and information around the three working groups as possible so that you can go into those informed and ready to make decisions about what is it that we really need to be doing? What does industry need to be doing? How do community-based organizations and those in the know about the community members that need to be served need to be doing and how do they get engaged? And what are the implications on education and workforce training? So with that, I'm just going to pause. Um, and I'd love to invite um, the other lead facilitator up um, just very quickly. And before I hand it over to you, Turner, just so you all know, we have a team. And you can see in the charter, again, 
all of the HEC staff that are involved, the workforce board staff that are involved, the leadership that's involved, and you also have a facilitation team that will be sort of lockstep um, in the coming months and really intensively in the next probably eight to nine months um, of leading the efforts of this industry consortium. So today I will be acting as guide and facilitator throughout the day. You will very soon um, also be led by Turner's team um, coming out of this, and especially as you get into your working groups um, coming out of today. So Turner, I'll turn it to you within 30 seconds. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. This is what I look like. <laughs> um, my name is Turner O'Dell. I work with the Oregon Consensus and Oregon Solutions Programs at the National Policy Consensus Center at Portland State University. Um, and we are a center, many of you may be familiar already with it. Uh, our focus is on collaborative governance, helping uh, folks from many sectors work together on important public policy issues of all sorts, um, whether it be healthcare or natural resources issues or all sorts of things. So um, I'm really happy to be here and be part of this. You'll be seeing more. I'll be I'll be in the background a little bit today, working with Lindsay. Uh, you'll see more of me at your future quarterly meetings, where I'll be. Uh, doing a lot of that facilitation and helping you all work together in that context. And then uh, colleagues of mine uh, will be working with the individual work groups, uh, working groups down the road as well. So you'll see our team in action more so down the road. But I'm glad to be here today. Um, feel free to come up and ask questions or whatever you have if you're curious about the center or you can know more. So thanks. So at this point, I would love just a quick introductions um, uh, around the table and just name an organization is what we have time for. But again, I encourage you to look in the pocket for more information about anyone and we will continue to fill this out. Um, know also that in your breakout sessions, you'll have a chance to reintroduce and get to know each other a little bit more. So Chris, we might yeah. start with you. So hi everyone, my name is Chris DeMars. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the director of the Delivery System Innovation Office at the Oregon Health Authority. And um, one of the offices that sits under me, it's called the Clinical Supports Integration and Workforce Unit. And Neelan Gupta is the director of that and is also a member um, of the concert, uh, this group, but is not able to attend today. So it's happy to be here. Good morning. I'm Kim Douthit. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Veterans Education Manager with the Oregon Department of Veterans Affairs, which is different from the Federal Department of Veterans Affairs. I just want to point that out. We're a state agency. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone, Heather Stafford, I'm the Executive Director of the Rogue Workforce Partnership, and I'm the Third Jackson Josephine County, so I'm from California. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Janet, and I'm the Chief of Pronouns. I'm the Executive Director for the Oregon Center for Nursing. Hi, I'm Kyle Stevens, I'm the Executive Director of the Southwestern Oregon Workforce Post at Board. We have Chris Curry and Douglas County, usually go by so. Thank you. And Renee Edwards, as uh, she her pronouns, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at OHSUL. Cheryl Cohen, I use she her pronouns, and I'm the Workforce Development Program Manager at the Civil Service Office. Janelle Ives, I use she her pronouns, and I serve as the Career Technical Education State Director of Technical Education. Sorry, I'd like to pause for a second. Consortium uh, members, when you're introducing yourselves, would you please speak up for our folks on Zoom? Um, receive some notifications that they're having a hard time. Is there a mic? Yeah, the one in the microphone. Yeah. yeah. Let's see what we get it with their speaker. Is it good? All right. Kathy Reynolds, Deputy Town Management, Legacy Health. Nice to meet you. Good morning. I'm Kim Myers. We're going to do this, Kathy. Hello, Charlotte Flood, CEO of Sweet Primary Care. I'm representing the Whoa, how'd you do it? Okay, Charlotte Flood, CEO for Northwest Primary Care. I'm representing the Oregon Independent Medical Association. Uh, Adrian Rennie is president of Portland Community College. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Arun Ariola with Advanced E-Commerce Solutions. I'm part of the Governor's uh, Racial Justice Council. I chair the Health Equity Committee. And also uh, part of the one who created uh, Future Ready Oregon 
with Doug and Jennifer and all the team members. Thank you for coming here. Uh, Janet Campbell, Oregon Health Leadership Council. Jennifer Purcell, Director of Future Ready Oregon at the Higher Education Coordinating Commission. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Katrina Dowdy. I use the she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the Healthcare Innovation Specialist at Oregon Bowling and also representing OSBA, the School Board Association. Hello, I'm Robin Moody, she, her pronouns. I'm Executive Director of Dental 3, soon to be renamed to All Smiles Community Oral Health. Good morning, Gail Kronauer, and I am the Senior Learning Economist at the Oregon Health Branch. Uh, Luke Corey, I'm an employment economist at the Oregon uh, Employment Department. Hi, I'm Heather Jeffress, and I'm the Executive Director of the Oregon Council for Behavioral Health, the largest trade association representing nonprofit, private, and some seen nonprofit stream HPs across the state of Oregon, delivering substance use disorder and mental health services to hundreds of thousands of Oregonians annually. And it's so nice to see people on the Zoom. It's going to take me an effort. Wait, I don't know. I don't know. You're in 3D, so it's great. <laughs> Hello, I'm Becky Holtberg. I'm the president and CEO of the Oregon Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. We're the trade association that represents Oregon's hospitals. Good morning, Sarah Lochner. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the executive director of the Oregon Coalition of Local Health Officials, representing Oregon's 33 local public health departments across the state. Hello, um, I'm Miranda Davis. I work with the Northwest Portland Area Amy Health Board. You won't see my name here because I'm here to represent Christina Peters, who works with the Northwest Portland Area Amy Health Board. Um, but we implement the Community Health Aid Program um, as well in Maine State Board in Alaska, and I am a dental health aid program director, so we dental teaching. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Berenger, and I'm the executive of the Oregon Medical Association. We represent the state's uh, physicians and PAs. So let's just quickly, um, I know we don't have time to introduce all staff, and HEC staff, I think, were acknowledged. I also, since since um, Chair Mercer couldn't be here, Todd, do you just want to introduce the board very quickly? And then maybe we'll just hear from Chair Pratt or Kyle. Sure, good morning, everybody. My name is Todd Nell. I'm the Director of the Workforce and Talent Development Board. It's good to see you all excited about today. Um, thanks, Duncan. Thanks, Marin. Thanks, Jennifer, and all the rest of you who um, made this happen. Chair Pratt, would you like to introduce yourself? Now, let's get on. I'm Tony Cross. I'm a citizen of the Seneca Nation, uh, founders and uh, you know, senior advisor to the National Indian Child Welfare Association, and I currently chair of the HEC. So, and I'm really glad to be here this morning to learn more about what you're doing. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And we will just so we have, because we have just a few um, sitting on that side, if you don't mind introducing yourself as well. All right. Hello, my name is Matt Batchelor. I'm from Oregon Coast Community College. I'm an ODE Career Connected Learning Systems Navigator. Right over here. Thank you. I'm Janie Griffin, the Dean of Nursing and um, Health Occupations at Columbia Gorge Community College. And this is new to me, although I've been in Vegas for many years. <laughs> Hi, I'm Laura Daly, and she her pronouns, and I'm the program manager with the Oregon Coalition of Local Health Officials. I'm here with Sarah. So. Hello, I'm uh, Dr. Jesse Hellitzo, and you see the new pronouns. I am a senior research and data analyst for what's known as the Oregon Longitudinal Data Collaborative, and you cross sector um, data from employment, higher ed, and K 12. Morning, everyone. Ben Tate, I'm the director of the Oregon Longitudinal Data Collaborative, and we are really thrilled to be here with you and looking forward to talking with you more later today. Thank you. So we're going to move on here. We're really going to try to keep on time today. So I'm going to hand this back to Jennifer. Um, throughout the day, we will have others sort of entering. You know, this is a long day, and so some couldn't make it for the morning, and so we will try to make sure we capture everybody in introductions. You will have a chance to continue getting to know the staff team um, behind all of this work as well. So, Jennifer, I'm going to turn it back to you now, um, and everyone, get your charters up, because this is going to be um, your 101 um, uh, with Jennifer on the charter. 
Thanks, Lindsay. Um, I will also draw your attention to a uh, one pager that was included in your packets that provides an overview of the Future Ready Oregon um, investment package. And we're gonna sort of walk through that and walk through a couple of the highlights uh, in the charter as well. And Eleni, if my slides are ready, look at that, like magic. Um, so super, I'm going to spend a few minutes with you this morning, uh, walking through what is Future Ready Oregon and how the industry consortia sort of fit into the broader uh, picture. What is the purpose and the structure for this group here? And, um, and then talk a little bit about uh, our meeting schedule and what to anticipate today and into the future. So first, I want to take a step back and I should point out my slides did not make it into your packet in time. So we will follow up, um, but you should be able to see uh, what's up on the screen and, um, and the con much of the content is in the one feature. Um, so taking a step back, I wanna review the origins of Future Ready Oregon. As has been mentioned, a number of folks in this room were engaged with the early development of the Future Ready Oregon legislation. But we want to make sure that everyone has sort of that same operating um, familiarity with, uh, with the guiding principles of the investments. Um, first and foremost, the disruption uh, created by the pandemic exacerbated an existing workforce crisis and exposed significant disparities in how our workforce systems serves Oregon's communities of color and other historically underserved and marginalized communities. And in early 2020, Governor Brown uh, convened the Rachel Justice Council to begin informing policy and budget decisions with a racial justice lens. And over the following year, workforce needs consistently emerged across all of the um, all of the policy areas as a priority. And so heading into the 2022 legislative session, the governor convened a work group that included a number of members here today. Um, many thanks to Marin as one of the co-chairs of that work and Duncan for his contributions. And, um, and this work group included education and workforce and community partners that really developed a comprehensive workforce investment proposal. It was in the 2022 legislative session. Oh, <laughs> okay, I'll speak up. Um, that one does not work, or it didn't a moment ago. Um, heading into the 2022 legislative yeah. session, uh, the legislature passed Senate Bill 1545 that provided a comprehensive $200 million package of investments that are all designed to work together to advance an equitable workforce system. Future Ready Oregon intentionally engages Oregon's historically underserved and underrepresented communities and the investments advance education and training opportunities that lead to employment in key sectors of Oregon's economy, including healthcare, manufacturing, and technology. Thank you. All right, we'll try this again. Um, next slide, please. So as we're implementing the Future Ready Oregon investments, we're guided by several core principles. First and foremost, the investments must work together to impact the entire workforce pipeline, facilitating seamless career-connected learning opportunities for Oregonians. Decision-making, including decisions around funding and policy, and processes must be grounded in racial justice and equity centered on serving priority populations and advancing a diverse workforce. And these core principles really are at the heart of the sustainability of these investments over time. Future Ready Oregon advances meaningful and inclusive partnerships and collaboration that will redefine Oregon's workforce system. And the industry consortia are really a piece of the puzzle that, um, that intends to advance that spirit of collaboration and partnership, where employers are actively engaged in identifying and informing high value credentials and workforce needs, and education and training providers are developing and delivering on those industry-driven, industry-informed credential pathways and training opportunities, 
and community-based organizations with trusted relationships with priority populations are facilitating recruitment and retention strategies and providing wraparound supports and services. Next slide, please. The Higher Education Coordinating Commission, or you'll hear us refer to as the HEC, is responsible for administering a majority of the Future Ready Oregon investments and providing comprehensive assessment and reporting across all of the programs. The HEC, as an agency, is charged with the statewide coordination of post-secondary education policy and funding with responsibility across all sectors of higher education and workforce development. And the HEC envisions a future in which all Oregonians benefit from the transformational power of quality, high quality of post-secondary education and training, and uh, envision a future where an individual's community or characteristic is no longer a predictor of those education and training outcomes. It's with this clearly defined focus on coordination that the HEC, through initiatives like Future Ready Oregon, advances its strategic goals of affordability, equity, student success, and economic and community impact. Next slide, please. We recognize that there are significant disparities in how our systems serve Oregon's communities of color and other historically marginalized communities. And this includes the access to and successful completion of education and training programs. And so it's with this awareness and understanding that the HEC applies its equity lens across all of its programs. HEC's equity lens was adopted by the commission in 2014 and drives our processes, policies, and investments advancing an equitable post-secondary education and training system and emphasizing historically underserved students and training participants with a particular focus on racial equity. At your next meeting, you'll have the opportunity to hear from HEC's Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, Rudy Ann Rivera-Lindstrom. She will be providing a more detailed introduction to HEC's equity lens as it will inform your work going forward. Next slide, please. The historic investments made through Future Ready Oregon are one example of how we are implementing HEX Equity Lens in our work. Future Ready Oregon provides funding to support people with education, training, and resources they need to get into good paying jobs by investing in innovation and informing an equitable workforce system. We're going to take a quick look at, a, at the suite of investments that are included in Future Ready. And again, we'll provide these slides in follow up, but on your one pager, there is a brief introduction to each of the, um, each of the funding opportunities. So first, investing in innovation. There are a number of grant programs included in Future Ready Oregon. Prosperity 10,000 is the program which provides $35 million to the local workforce development boards. Thank you to Kyle and Heather for being here today to represent the boards in this important conversation. Local workforce development boards have been um, implementing Prosperity 10,000 funding to expand their capacity to provide career coaching services, develop the training opportunities, and provide scholarships and stipends and wraparound supports and services. These investments through Prosperity 10,000 are not specific to the three key sectors. Each of the local boards is advancing partnerships um, and expanding relationships to really invest in regionally significant workforce needs. For most of the boards that includes healthcare and manufacturing and technology, but they also have a number of uh, regionally identified uh, workforce priorities that they're investing in as well. Next, Future Ready Oregon invests uh, $14.9 million in the continuation and expansion of post-secondary career pathways training programs at each of Oregon's 17 community colleges. The career pathways um, training programs are education and training programs that are coupled with or connected to student support services that enable individuals to secure a job or advance in a high wage, high demand occupation. 
Future Ready also made a $10 million investment in credit for prior learning grants. Credit for prior learning allows Oregonians to receive credit for the knowledge and skills gained through work and life experience. This can include military training, significant work experience, and through formal and informal education and training from institutions of higher education in the United States and other countries. These grants were competitively awarded to 14 community colleges and five public universities to scale up their credit for prior learning systems and the infrastructure across all academic areas. And then the largest investment in innovation in the future Ready Oregon suite of investments is $95 million in workforce ready grants. These grants are intended to encourage innovation and broaden the partners that comprise our workforce system. Grants are available to community-based and culturally specific organizations and education and training providers to fund the creation and expansion of education and training programs in healthcare, manufacturing, and technology, to expand the capacity of organizations to provide workforce development services, as well as to provide direct benefits to individuals, including stipends for earn and learn experiences, funding to pay for education and training costs, job readiness supplies, as well as those important wraparound supports and services. You'll also see here that there are some additional funds being administered by our partners at the Youth Development Division and Boley uh, to expand youth programs and registered apprenticeships. Future Ready Oregon investments also uh, intend to inform an equitable workforce system. And I want to draw your attention to two, uh, the last two programs on what we affectionately refer to as the spider web. Um, first is the Workforce Benefits Navigators. This program builds on the success of House Bill 2835 that was passed by the legislature in 2021 and placed benefits navigators at all of Oregon's community colleges and public universities. Future Ready Oregon will place workforce benefits navigators in WorkSource Oregon one-stop centers and community-based organizations across the state. Navigators will provide a single point of contact to efficiently help individuals access the resources that meet their unique needs and help them navigate the different workforce training programs and benefits that are available. And then of course, industry consortia, why we're here today. Over the coming months, the HEC, in partnership with the Workforce and Talent Development Board, will convene statewide industry consortia in three of our state's key industry sectors, healthcare, manufacturing, and technology. The industry consortia are designed to build partnerships as I mentioned, that more deeply engage employers, education and training partners, and community-based organizations to co-create solutions to our most pressing workforce development challenges. We're going to look more closely at the purpose and intention for the industry consortia in just a moment, but first I want to mention a word about HEC's plans for assessment and accountability for the Future Ready Oregon investments. Next slide, please. Our plans center around two intertwined questions that will guide all of HEC's reporting and data collection. As I mentioned, HEC is responsible for reporting on the impacts of the entirety of the investment across the state enterprise. And first, we'll be looking at whether Future Ready Oregon leads to greater economic security and whether Future Ready Oregon leads to greater equity, especially racial equity. Analysis will examine access to the funding and workforce training programs, both on the part of organizations pursuing grant funding, as well as individuals seeking education and training opportunities. We'll also ask how the investments are put into practice, learning about the experience of grantees and the experiences of individuals in the different training programs. And finally, we plan to examine outcomes to understand the economic impacts and equity impacts of the Future Ready Oregon investment. At the end of December of last year, HEC's Office of Research and Data published the first annual report on Future Ready Oregon. It is available on our website, and if you would like more information, we'll make sure and provide that in follow-up. The first year's report focuses primarily on implementation, 
um, the early implementation in the first eight months of the program, and also describes statewide labor force and education trends that we'll use as baseline data for tracking progress in the coming years. Subsequent annual reports will evaluate participation in future ready Oregon programs, including degree completion, credential attainment, and job placement rates compared to the statewide educational attainment goals and long-term employment projections. Um, data collection began last fall for the HEC administered programs that served participants in 2022, and quarterly data collection continues as we're adding new programs and bringing programs online. HEC's Office of Research and Data is in the process of preparing some of that preliminary data for public release. And we anticipate that that early implementation um, findings for future ready Oregon investments will inform your work as a consortium, and we expect that your work as a consortium will continue to inform future investments. Next slide, please. So the industry consortia, um, I want to talk about that a little bit more, and this is where we'll transition to some of the parts of the charter. Industry consortia were envisioned as a forum for building partnerships and more deeply engaging employers, education and training providers, and community-based organizations. You will hear us refer to that sort of three-legged stool over and over again, and I appreciated Lindsay's comment. The industry consortium is Oregon putting that idea to work and really um, implementing this idea that co-creating solutions to our workforce problems is going to um, advance a diverse workforce in Oregon. And in order to best position the consortium for success, as Lindsay mentioned, the HEC and the Workforce and Talent Development Board retained the Lindsay, uh, the, the Lindsay Group, the, the Wolsey Group, um, as an implementation partner and strategist to help us design the consortia framework and better engage industry partners. Next slide, please. The industry consortia will provide a forum for consistent employer engagement to comprehensively understand business needs and industry trends. This will be a place where industry leaders and public partners can share ideas, collaborate, and innovate on complex workforce challenges that impede economic opportunity and equity, and a forum for intentional integration of our talent systems and economic strategies. Industry consortia will build on local and regional investments while advancing statewide sector-specific strategies that align with Oregon's economic agenda. You all will be providing consistent, integrated workforce supply and demand data. Some of the working group work will launch today in that area. Uh, facilitating trusted skills, standards, and high value stackable credentials for a variety of career pathways in the healthcare sector. Identifying and mapping Oregon's industry specific education and training assets. We'll start to explore a little bit of that today. And most importantly, identify gaps and opportunities that can inform strategic investments in the months to come. And lastly, the consortium will be identifying promising practices that advance recruitment, retention, and career advancement strategies that address the persistent underrepresentation of priority populations in industry specific job opportunities and career pathways. Next slide, please. A little bit about your structure. You've heard from Lindsay and Turner a bit about the role of the Woolsey Group and Oregon Consensus. Additionally, this uh, the work of this consortium and its working groups will be supported by HEX Future Ready Oregon staff, including our new healthcare industry consortium uh, policy analyst, who is on her fourth day, uh, Sarah Foster, if you would just wave. Um, Sarah is going to be your primary point of contact uh, going forward, uh, as well as your executive leadership team sitting to my left, including Janet Campbell, president of the Oregon Health Leadership Council, uh, Dr. Oh, I want to go out of order, Marin Ariel, <laughs> uh, Rachel Justice Council member and president of Advanced Economic Solutions, and Dr. Adrian Bennings, president for Portland Community College. Again, 
drawing on that three-legged stool of ensuring that we're co-creating solutions with industry partners, community-based organizations, and education and training providers. Your executive leadership team will be speaking momentarily um, and will be responsible for acting as subject matter experts and innovative thinkers, um, providing practical guidance to industry consortium staff and driving deliverables and working group outcomes. Um, as consortium members, all of you will be assessing the statewide healthcare workforce needs, understanding skills standards and the different career pathways, and making strategic policy and funding recommendations to address gaps and opportunities. These recommendations will then be informed by working groups. We mentioned the three working groups that will be standing up here today. Um, and, and these will include consortium members as well as additional subject matter experts. So you all will be having a conversation about that today um, and exploring uh, next steps. And nearly last but not least, a little bit about the timeline and outcomes. Next slide, please. In the short term, which we envision will be the balance of um, 2023, the consortium will inform HEC's future ready Oregon funding opportunities. It's expected that this group will reach consensus on a first set of recommendations to inform future rounds of workforce ready grant funding. And in the longer term, 2024 and beyond, the consortium will continue to assess statewide industry specific workforce needs, skill standards and career pathways, serving as advisory to the state's Workforce and Talent Development Board and the Higher Education Coordinating Commission, making strategic policy and funding recommendations. Following today's kickoff meeting, we anticipate the full consortium will meet quarterly beginning in June. Um, sorry about the uh, spacing uh, on that, but the intention is tentatively, uh, we'll hold that first quarterly meeting that first week of June, um, second quarterly meeting in early September and the third quarterly meeting in early December. Um, in the meantime, working groups will be meeting more frequently and the full consortium meetings, um, as we have noted, will be held in person and we expect that the working groups will meet virtually because those will be more frequent uh, convenings. I do also want to take a moment to note that consortium meetings will be open to the public. Thank you to, um, to our guests here today, both in person and online. We do appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate balancing the importance of productivity and advancing decision making while also um, providing for accessibility and transparency. So thanks. And the, the team is doing a fantastic job of that balancing act. So uh, appreciate everyone's hard work today. Um, Lastly, I do want to just note, uh, last slide, please, or next slide, um, as you work towards that first set of recommendations, it's important to note that Future Ready Oregon strategically combines state general fund and federal American Rescue Plan Act funding to advance a more equitable workforce system. The general fund investments included in Future Ready were intended to advance innovation in the short term leveraging existing relationships and administrative infrastructure. As I mentioned, those include the Community College Career Pathways programs, credit for prior learning, Prosperity 10,000 in partnership with the local workforce boards. And in contrast, the Federal American Rescue Plan Act funding, um, well, I guess I'll take a step back. The general fund investments have to be spent by the end of the biennium, which is this June and up uh, to date. HEC has obligated the nearly $50 million in grant funding that uh, is being administered by the HEC. Um, and those projects are wrapping up in the next couple of months. The ARPA funding, in contrast, does not have to be obligated until the end of 2024 and spent by the end of 2026. So that gives us a little bit of extra time to be intentional about investing in innovative programs and approaches. And that's where the work of the consortia comes in. Um, so as was mentioned earlier, the Workforce Ready Grants, you'll see on the right-hand side, 
represent the largest investment in Future Ready Oregon. And these grants are intended to encourage innovation and broaden the partners that comprise our workforce system. An initial round of workforce ready grant funding was made available for the 10 million in uh, general funding that you can see on the left hand side. We awarded funding to 41 projects uh, to be administered by community based organizations and workforce service providers across the state. Um, and recently we announced that the request for applications for the next round of funding moving into that ARPA uh, bucket is now open. Applications will be accepted through June 23rd. And whereas the first round of funding focused really specifically on capacity building, bringing new partners into the system and expanding the capacity of organizations to provide workforce services, this second round of funding will advance innovation and workforce programming, really focused on incentivizing those partnerships that I have mentioned a number of times between employers, education and training providers, and community-based organizations. While Future Ready Oregon investments do provide a significant opportunity and are seeding and strengthening new projects and organizations to engage in this work um, and advance opportunities for priority populations, it really is the durable, long-term, transformational work that we'll be doing here around building new relationships and partnerships and, and the ways we're working together, um, that's where the transformational work of Future Ready Oregon happens. And so we couldn't be more thrilled to be kicking off that work today. And I wanna turn it over to um, the leadership team to provide some opening remarks that will really ground us um, in, and center us, remind us of the importance of this work. And Janet, do you want to go ahead and start? Thanks, Jennifer. Um, and thanks, everyone. It's great to be here and see. I'm not sure if that's on. It is on. Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I have a soft voice. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I have the privilege of being um, a leader at the Oregon Health Leadership Council, which is a member of our organization made up of about 44 organizations, payer, provider, and associations. It's a unique table. Um, and I came into it you know, almost a couple of years ago, but this table was set up in about 2008. And the, the genesis of setting up that table was to say, how can we collectively um, solve the problems of, of healthcare around the state of Oregon? Because the, the organization recognized that there are some things that can be known, and there are some things that actually require collaboration amongst all the partners. And so that's what that organization has done. Um, it's interesting as we were talking about our strategy, we identified three areas of strategic focus. Cost, um, who doesn't want to reduce healthcare cost? <laughs> um, care, we all want to have quality care that's equitable. And workforce, um, recognizing that was very net new to this organization because of the pandemic. So before the pandemic, uh, this group was not really saying we need to deal with workforce wonder why, right? But because of the pandemic and how the pandemic has highlighted those areas that are broken, we absolutely recognize we got to talk about workforce. And so this was net new. We can say, well, we haven't solved cost. We have been talking about cost. And while we haven't solved care, we have been talking about care. But for sure, we do not really have a grasp on how we're going to solve workforce. Um, I would say the most valuable asset for any health system is its workforce. Um, if anyone wants to argue about that, let's talk later. Uh, for healthcare organization, healthcare shortages are really a complex problem. And they have a lot of underlying causative factors, such as the job design, work design, culture, um, the work supply, and policy. All of these have contributed to dissatisfaction, frustration, and burnout amongst its employees. We all know, and there's a lot of economists here, so as I, as I say this, um, healthcare makes up roughly, what, 20% of the US healthcare economy. And in order for it to be effective, it has to heavily depend on both its clinical and non-clinical staff who collectively deliver care. And I think a lot of times now when you research workforce, you see maybe one or two job types coming up, 
so nurses or physicians, but you don't see the rest of the continuum of what makes up healthcare workforce. Um, and so we have to talk about that, right? Um, I also think that for healthcare organizations, uh, recognizing that their employees are suffering from burnout and suffering from increased workload, for employers, that in turn has increased shortages and labor costs. Two-letter word that is very painful. And for consumers, we have limited access to essential services. So we all need to stress and worry about this. But what excites me about this table is the fact that we can collectively figure out how we need to solve this. At the OHLC, um, we brought together about, we stood up a workforce advisory group. And there were about 14 organizations that participated since June of last year. Um, and we recognized we needed to talk short-term and long-term. And I see a few of those folks uh, who were part of that advisory group. And I love the fact that that work now can uh, be part of an input into this work. But there were things that, that, I, that it was nice to hear all of these subject matter experts saying, we got to solve this together. We're all digging from the same well. <laughs> so, you know, if you get a nurse today, I might get that nurse back to my organization tomorrow, right? So what do we collectively do? One other thing that came up, actually a couple, was you got to make Oregon an attractive place to come and work, period. And that really doesn't have a whole lot to just do with healthcare alone. It has a whole lot to do with everyone in this room and then some, right? And we have been in the news. And we know that there's a reputation out there, which is an impediment to how you attract labor, how you retain labor, because you might get them and then they come and then they leave. And so this, these kinds of things and trends have to be talked about by the right leaders in the room. It cannot just be a 44 member organization. So there is a big why, and I'm very excited to be here and to be part of this team and this three-legged stool because healthcare starts all the way from education and it ends all the way in a career path. Thank you, Janet. I'll keep it short. I know we're in short of time, but it's been a long journey since we had our first meeting with Jennifer and some of the other committee members. And honestly, I never expected it to get to this point, especially when we asked for $200 million. I was shocked. We got the whole amount of money. But going back to the pandemic, um, you know, during the pandemic, we saw the need for collaboration, as Jenna mentioned. We had community-based organizations, we had business, we had medical providers, we had uh, local kind of public health department, we had everybody working together. And that model collaboration was so essential in fighting the pandemic. If it wasn't for that collaboration model, I guarantee you the pandemic would have had more uh, illness, more death within our community. And so for me, as part of the RGC with the governor, equity is really important. And the sense for me, equity really means that every person is their organ gives us respect and value, no matter who they are. Very simple, it's not that complicated. So being part of this group for me personally, I want to be sure that we continue collaborating, but also making sure that we value community-based organizations. They did a lot of work during the pandemic. They were on the front line doing with testing, vaccination, going after delivering food, delivering services to the community. That was powerful. And you know, I remember working with a lot of community disorganizations that were scared. You know, there are near people that had COVID when we first started. We were all had a lot of trauma and anxiety, but they went out there and did the work. So this is really important that whatever we do, that CBO is a part of this picture because they were essential in really serving vulnerable communities that in general helped all our audience. And you as medical providers and partners, it's really important that you work with them, value them, treasure them. And personally, community health care workers. Are very important. And that's the issue we're going to be working with the governor. They're very important in reducing health disparities. You know, I know we have a program here in the state that we get certified, but when you borrow them, we need sustainable funding to make sure that they grow and nurture our community. And so, for me personally, thank you for being here. Please speak your mind, be open, be honest, be real and intentional. We're here to learn and work from one another. Thank you. And I'll just add co sign on everything. <laughs> no, okay. I'll say a, a, a few brief remarks. Glad to be here wrapping up my ninth month um, as president of Portland Community College. And this is a hot topic, um, as you may or may not have seen even for Portland Community College. And so 
Oh my goodness, the timing is perfect, I can say. So um, to Jennifer's charge uh, in terms of giving remarks and just keeping our, our eye on the why, the W-H-Y, I'm reminded of this quote by Simon Sinek, he's one of my favorite authors and speaks about regardless of what we do, our why, our driving purpose, our motivation never changes. And although we represent different purposes and organizations and missions in this space, I think that collectively our why is for the economic mobility and social justice of all populations across the state. So I was looking at a little data um, before this time, and one of the things that's insightful and really raised my awareness on some of the picture uh, in terms of the nursing uh, or the healthcare picture here in the state was, you know, you have CNAs, you have LPNs, and you have RNs, and you have nursing practitioners practitioners. But as you look at it, if you picture it as a triangle, at the bottom of that triangle, if you talk about CNAs all the way up to nursing practitioners, the diversity is increasingly lost the higher you go up that triangle. And why is that? And then, so there's so many factors that I think that we have an opportunity to unpack and address in this space in alignment with tax priority populations, but also looking at the challenges in workforce, in industry, in communities, but also challenges in education. And so, um, and, and then how do we align that with state regulations? Um, and so there's, uh, it doesn't change or deter us from the why, but it has us, and we should come into this space asking why are we not positioning ourselves to meet the needs of the state across the nation, but also in those priority populations that we say we're here to really ensure that there's this opportunity. So I'll end it with, you know, there's three things that are very near and dear to my heart as an educational leader, but that's access, affordability and equity. And when we say equity, what do we really speak and when we say that in this space? And so you know, we can have a hundred million different um, interpretations of equity, uh, but I think as we come together, I'm excited about this work and just knowing that it's really honed in not on uh, just my realm as education, but in my purpose for being here as a human being to help others and serve others. Thank you so much. Um, we appreciate your leadership and your passion for this work. I'm going to turn it back over to Lindsay, and we have the opportunity to hear from um, some subject matter experts today, uh, continuing the theme of the fire hydrant of information. <laughs> right. So fire hydrant of information is right. And I wanted to remind you that the purpose of this morning is information. Um, and we will have time to then kind of take deep breaths, um, discuss, answer questions, make comments, especially as we get into our breakouts. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jennifer, for, for the 101, which is very important. And thank you um, to the executives of the Industry Consortium and who also will each be sharing individually your breakout groups, by the way. So I wanted to just highlight that. Um, that we've asked each of them to play that role going forward. So in the spirit um, of, of information and baseline setting, right? Um, remember that slide um, around accountability. And there were two questions, and if you haven't written these questions down, now's a good time, right? Does Future Ready Oregon improve economic security? Does Future Ready Oregon improve equity? That's it right there, right? And so the work of the industry consortium must be to answer those questions and to guide other pieces and parts of Future Ready Oregon to implement the solutions to those questions. And so with that, we are going to start one by one. I'm going to introduce um, our baseline setters here. Um, and we are going to stick to um, a lot of time. We can buy a little bit of time, you know, at the break. If you all need breaks, of course, you know, you can get up and take those. We will be taking an official break after these presentations. But if our speakers can stick to their allotted 10 to 15 minutes of presentation with just five minutes of break <laughs> clarification. Um, <laughs> well, I say that, that was not the rest of the two <laughs> Um, so with this, I'd like to first ask, um, this is really to inform the integrating workforce supply and demand data work group. Now, some of you know you have already been assigned or self-selected to these work groups. So particularly for those of you who are headed into that work group um, to be constructive, we want you to really hear um, what is being presented. I'm going to introduce at this point Gail, Gail Kovenhauer, State Employment Economist, Oregon Employment Department, um, to kick us off. 
Um, and then I will introduce other speakers as we go, if that's okay. Okay, I'll hand the mic to you. Thank you so much. Hello, good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> Well, I'm really grateful to be here to share uh, just some, some broad uh, labor market and economic context about where we are in Oregon as the, uh, the healthcare consortium gets underway. So I'll get us right into it and try to be brief, but not too brief uh, as we move into the next slide. Um, as you all are well aware, uh, Oregon and the entire nation had a uh, both an abrupt and a very deep uh, recession with job losses, um, really unlike we've seen before during the spring of 2020. Now, as we come into the spring of 2023, uh, Oregon and the U.S. have recovered from that. Uh, Oregon fully recovered the 281,000 jobs that were lost uh, as of November of last year. Uh, so we now have more jobs than we did before the pandemic. That's also true for the U.S. Uh, and one thing that I often hear and that I'm trying to display here is that uh, those jobs are there, even though we've regained all of them and expanded beyond that, they're, they're not all in the same spots they used to be. So everything didn't fall back in the place that it was before. So here's what a geographic uh, look of that is, um, in that the darkest shaded area, those are all the counties in Oregon that have more jobs now than they did in February, 2020. Uh, and that is 23 of the 36 counties. So in the majority of the state we've seen uh, that we have fully recovered and now expanded beyond where we were. We're seeing slower recovery along the Oregon coast in some areas of Southern Oregon and a little bit more in Eastern Oregon. Next slide. And uh, thank you. Uh, Similarly, uh, all the jobs aren't distributed across Oregon's economic sectors like they were before. Uh, we've seen some industries come back and move beyond uh, to the highest employment levels we've ever seen. Construction is an example of that. Professional and technical services is another example of that. Unfortunately, healthcare is not an example of that. Uh, healthcare has not recovered all the jobs that were lost in the pandemic recession. Uh, and even within healthcare, we can see that the trends were really different, where the ambulatory healthcare services, those doctors, uh, specialist offices, dentist offices, things like that, really had um, tremendous job losses, the steepest right in the beginning of the pandemic. That's the kind of elective stuff, you know, you can put off getting a teeth cleaning for a while. Uh, and then they really bounced back, not fully, but about 900 jobs below where they were in February of 2020. So it really kind of weathered the best in terms of jobs recovery. Uh, hospitals are still down by about 1,000 jobs compared to where they were in February 2020. Uh, and one thing that I think is important to note about that is that there was this period, uh, particularly during uh, 2021, where we were seeing those big waves, the Delta, the Omicron waves, um, where there were, um, there were about 3,000 jobs that aren't accounted for in this graph that came in from temporary health services, primarily designed to do healthcare support and to Janet's point before at great cost. Uh, and, but so that's not, but again, that's not permanent either. That's largely worked its way through. And we're seeing that there's still fewer jobs in hospitals now than ever with the pandemic recession. Um, and by far the, um, the greatest deficit is in nursing and residential care facilities. Uh, where we saw you know, those were the early hot spots of the pandemic breakouts. Um, and nursing and residential care facilities also, I think it was to, to Janet's point before, um, they had some kind of structural disadvantages within the healthcare sector prior to the pandemic recession. This made that more evident. It made a lot of things more evident about the healthcare sector, which I'll talk about a little bit more as we go along. But um, the nursing and residential care facilities already tended to lose workers to other parts of healthcare before the pandemic recession. Um, and then with some of the conditions that existed early in the pandemic recession, uh, some of those workers left and just never came back. Uh, and yes. I'm sorry, I had a question. Yes. Can you explain further how your, do your numbers account at all for contract labor? Because we are still seeing really high rates of contract labor. So can you define what a job is when you're talking about a job? Yes, that's an excellent question. And I did allude to it, but didn't fully explain it. So uh, these are payroll jobs uh, on the payroll of healthcare employers. So this is on a hospital's actual payroll as opposed to the contract labor as well. We do have overall uh, uh, temp health services data 
And actually for a while, we were tracking all the firms that we could find within them that we could tell were healthcare related to see what was going on with them to try to supplement those areas. Um, so there are some areas where there's still a high contract labor and, and we've been in, I've been in discussions just this week with organizations that are trying to find ways to wrangle those costs um, within that. So I know it's still occurring. Um, in different to different levels in different areas, but it's not part of core rate. And I just think why that's important is that I think that's really undercounting mm -hmm. the job the hosp in hospitals. And whereas in, in other care settings, there are probably more bed closures and staff reductions when they when there's no labor. So that's that's why I want I thought that was like an important distinction. Yes, it is an important distinction. Thank you for bringing it up. And I and I think it could also speak to also. Um, whether or not something is a temporary change or a structural change, where there may just be a greater amount of this kind of contracted labor happening in the future. And I'm not sure because I don't have the best pulse on that in terms of the balance of how different parts of the, the sector operate, but it is something that could potentially speak to that as a, an ongoing issue if it becomes one or an increasing one. Yes? Just uh, Kathy Reynolds. So it's just a question on the definition of job. Does this include post vacant openings and it's in full time, part time, or all? Oh, I promise I didn't pay you to say that. We're going to get to it. <laughs> <laughs> these are the jobs that are on the actual payroll. So these are payroll employees that the nursing residential care facility paid or that the dentist paid on their payroll. Okay, I'll move to the next slide. I'll get to the part that everybody's looking to find out about. Okay, the other thing that I want to do, just a broad context setting uh, before we, we dive into job vacancies, uh, is um, as you've seen this you know, kind of broader jobs recovery, we've seen unemployment come down tremendously low again. Uh, Oregon's unemployment rate was 4.4% in March of 2023. Uh, that's relatively low and actually relatively rare. Uh, since 1976, there have only been four periods of time that Oregon's unemployment rate has been at or below 4.5%. Uh, that was in January and February of 1995, uh, from October 2016 to March 2020, uh, and then from for part of 21 and 22, uh, we popped up just a little bit there, but are now um, kind of just down below that line. So whether or not you're above or below that that bright line doesn't necessarily matter. It's if you look back over the course of history, that's pretty low. So um, there's not a whole lot of available workers out there for the many employers who are trying to hire. Um, again, just quickly for the next slide, um, as it kind of showed with employment, again, with unemployment, um, there's a lot to digest here. And so I really just want to kind of highlight that lower bar is the lowest any areas unemployment rate has been since at least 1990. The highest, the top bar is the highest it's been. And the, the dot in the middle shows where it is right now. So basically all across Oregon, you're seeing unemployment rates that are at or near their lowest recorded. It's not just one area of the state that's doing poorly or better or unemployment is low everywhere. Okay, next. Um, again, the thing that's really um, encouraging that we've seen is, is uh, we've seen increased labor force participation. So the share of the population that's 16 or older that is either working or doesn't have a job but has been actively looking for work in the past four weeks, that's been at its highest rate in about, about a decade. So we've really seen um, an increase or an uptick in that. Now, with this trend, I'm not sure how much more of this we can see going forward because we've seen that even though our labor force is at a very high level, um, it's not continuing to grow really much at all the past handful of months. And so I'm not particularly sure how much more this can grow given the aging demographics, which is why you've seen this decline over time. You know, uh, back in, in 1999, there were a lot more baby boomers in the workforce now uh, than there are now. So um, I'm not sure how much more of this we can see going up given the demographics, but um, and that the labor force doesn't seem to be growing, but it is encouraging that it's higher than it was um, for most of the past decade. Okay, turning to the unfilled jobs. So uh, all the stuff that I've been talking about so far is about, you know, really great job growth across the economy, low unemployment, you know, those are really nice signs of a pretty strong labor market in Oregon. At the same time, it adds tremendously to the difficulty that employers with job openings have trying to fill them. So, uh, like I was just talking about, saying that Oregon's unemployment was, was really low through, you know, 2021, 2022, it's still really low now by historical standards. It's about as low as it was in 2019. 
The thing that's different between now and 2019 is that employers have been trying to build out twice as many job openings with the same number of available workers. And I think everybody could stand up here and school me about what that feels like as an employer. Um, but the bars tell me here that it's really difficult. So about seven out of 10 job openings have been difficult to fill. Uh, and that's really because, you know, as we see this really high level of job openings happening all across the economy over an extended period of time, it just increases the competition that employers have to get this limited available workforce. Um, so that's making it really hard to fill jobs. And again, it's eased just a little bit in recent months, uh, but not enough for it to be meaningfully easier to find tech workers. All right, next slide. I wanted to give a specific shout out to healthcare, uh, where, so again, before the pandemic recession, we've been doing a job vacancy survey since 2013. Every quarter, we ask employers what jobs they're trying to, to hire for, uh, whether or not they're hard to fill, what the average starting wage is, uh, education requirements, uh, so ever since 2013, private health care and social assistance has almost universally had the largest number of job openings. It's a large, and has been with the asterisks of the past couple of years, a large and consistently growing sector despite economic conditions for at least the past few decades. Uh, so healthcare and social assistance has not only the most job vacancies, but also the most difficult to fill job vacancies of any sector in Oregon. Uh, and in terms of occupations, uh, again, but both before and after the, the pandemic recession, personal care aides, nursing assistants, and registered nurses consistently top the list of occupations with the most difficult to fill vacancies. And I want everybody to take a quick snapshot in your brain of those average starting wages as we move into the next part of the conversation. And as we're thinking about the support staff, the, the housekeeping staff, the the janitorial staff, the cafeteria workers that didn't make this list, but are critical to the functioning of a hospital or a nursing residential care facility. As we move to the next slide, um, I wanna, oh, maybe it's the one after this, but, um, but one of the things that I wanna think about is that private healthcare and social assistance, or, or all healthcare, oh, one more, or back one thing is an area where you're more likely to require some education beyond high school to be able to care for the patients that are coming into your setting. So whereas about one out of three job openings in Oregon requires some education beyond high school, uh, it's slightly more than half, just like basic requirements, right? And if you, or basic requirements, and if you wanna be um, competitive, if you wanna be competitive, it's um, two thirds, I believe, or more than two thirds, requires some sort of education beyond high school. That's, or I think it's two thirds overall, maybe four out of five for healthcare. So there's just much greater likelihood to need some sort of education beyond high school. So as you're thinking about that, it takes time to train those people. It also, on the other end, takes some sort of a pay premium, right? To be able to give up money now to get it later. And in some of these occupations where we're seeing both a greater need for education beyond high school and not necessarily significantly greater wages, that's a choice that may be exacerbating um, for workers going elsewhere. Um, so I really wanted to make sure to kind of highlight how that is a particular sticking point in this kind of economic environment where there are help wanted signs everywhere. Yes. I appreciate that. This is Thank you guys saw on the list, the number one uh, most important goals in the health sector. And uh, mass result in the health people in a fast working environment, both the uh, youth, non security, on the commercial side, and then Medicaid shifts with great investment related to us, since your education, or continuing education, which is appreciating the expense. Um, we did recently great, great investment in the other one, um, but it was the wages that. Um, We've been well and I think regional stats that we gave our health center. I know that it doesn't impact over here, but um, I just I appreciate that. And it's a huge issue. Yes. Uh, and so as we move to the next one too, the, the other part of the, the puzzle that's also particularly concerning to me for healthcare is that, um, as I was saying, more likely to need some sort of education beyond high school. And we're seeing that that pipeline is not as well stocked as it has been in recent years. We've seen enrollments uh, 
and, and the number of professional degrees or certificates awarded by post-secondary institutions in healthcare decline, and it's rebounded, but not fully rebounded to where it was in 2019. And again, for something that takes time to get people trained up to do the right kind of job, um, that's something that could make the crunch extend further into the future, um, especially when, I mean, you know, Oregon does import some of our healthcare workers from other states. Historically, we've been able to do that from Idaho or elsewhere, uh, but there are moments are now too. So um, that's, it's not necessarily getting easiest. Uh, and the other thing that is um, kind of, a, I don't know how many walls I put on this crunch now, but the other one is that um, private healthcare and social assistance also has the greatest number of workers who are ages 55 and older, 70,000. Uh, and that those are folks who are maybe looking hopefully for their opportunities to be retiring at some point. And so that is just gonna kind of build what's already a very large need. Yes, Mark? Do you have a question? Yeah. Do you know how to push the other we we have some limited data that we're able to get. So we can, it's usually through the US Census Bureau. And what we need to be able to use is a five-year set of data because it's a, a pretty small sample. Uh, so we can look right now at from about 20, I think it's 2017 to 2021, which is helpful, but maybe not quite as current as we would like. There are a couple of other sources that we can look at. Um to see if there's any you know consistency or inconsistency among those but it's it's challenging for us to get as current data as we would like at that level of detail but we, we can get it all right i think that that's it for me if anybody has any other questions feel free to ask yes we have about two minutes for questions we are going to take this section of the agenda until 10 past 12 and we will catch up um, so two minutes of questions here. Otherwise, you will also see fail again in breakouts. Okay, well, thank, thank you. you. Well done, by the way, getting that all in. We have designed this very purposely. I hope you can um, sort of tell that being able to hear from Dale about the supply and the demand data um, with some specific healthcare pieces here and the questions that you're asking to further clarify but you've already alluded to some of the next set of questions. So um, who we're going to hear from next, and, and uh, this will be same time frame, but two speakers, I believe. So we'll see how they do. We're going to hear from Ben Tate, um, the Oregon Longitudinal Data Collaborative Director from the HEC, as well as Dr. Jesse Hosekso, the Senior Research and Data Analyst from Oregon Longitudinal Data, Data Collaborative. And this really will be focused more on the post-secondary education shortage, um, particularly in healthcare and in nursing. So I'll turn it to you, equal time. We have 20 minutes. Hopefully that will include questions sort of along the way and at the end, and I will hold these up for time. Perfect, thank you. My time is brief. Um, I'm gonna intro, I'm gonna say 30 seconds or less on the program, see if I can actually accomplish that. Dr. Helixo, we're gonna take you at breakneck speed through the research, 20 minutes less than. Um, is not enough to, to really get in. So we're going to try and hit the high points that we think are relevant for the conversation today. Um, but in terms of the information hose, we're going to turn that up to 11 on meter for the next few minutes. So um, if you can go to the next slide, just the 30 seconds or less on who we are. So um, as we mentioned during the intros, OLDC is a shared service between these three partner agencies, the Department of Education, the Higher Education Coordinating Commission, and the Employment Department. The idea is that we get the data from those agencies that they administratively collect, we match it at an individual level, and then study um, the results um, and, and produce research and reporting as a result. The idea here is not that we dive into any single sector. Those agencies are, are more than capable of doing that on their own. What we do is look at how those sectors impact and influence each other. So this particular study we're looking specifically at post-secondary and how that influences and impacts workforce. Uh, we are governed by those agencies, so we live administratively within HEC. We are HEC employees, but the three uh, agencies that provide data to us are the ones that set our direction, set the research agenda, and, and kind of set the policies uh, and processes we use. Okay, I think that's all I can cover in the 30 seconds I have. Um, so I'm gonna start, turn it over to Dr. Helixo. Um, I think just as two seconds of intro, as we mentioned, um, this is really focused on the post-secondary aspects of this. We know that there's a larger uh, 
breadth of components. We've talked about that already this morning that influence workforce in this space. So this study was not designed to touch everything. In fact, there would be a number of things that we'd say, hey, we saw this, but it's out of scope uh, for us. So we know this is a complicated endeavor. The study isn't uh, intended to address everything. It's just intended to look at a couple of key aspects when we specifically talk about education. All right. Thanks, man. You go to the next slide. I'm gonna go quick if I can. There's a ton of data. Um, so this is the, you look through the slides, which is just how the study was designed. As we are governed by three separate agencies, they selected us, they selected this topic that will be all healthcare in the state of Oregon, but the, the data led us straight to nursing right away. So we'll get to that. So the next slide. Um, you can access the full report and summary report from the OBC. Next slide. So we hypothesized that we actually have a surplus of students looking to enter the healthcare field in the state of Oregon, so it's just found to be true. And that um, we had a, uh, a shortage of actually healthcare workers in the state of Oregon. We hypothesized we would likely find some kind of bottleneck occurring with an education in the state of Oregon, and we did in the area of nursing. And go to the next slide. So here's an overview of what our major findings would be. This is the total number of applicants into our nursing programs in the state of Oregon, qualified applicants. We only accepted about 22% in 2010, and we needed to uh, accept another 15% of total qualified applicants to meet job demand across the state of Oregon in nursing. Um, the reasons for this, we surveyed all of our colleges and we in contact with them the entire time. Um, nursing faculty don't make enough. In fact, we were one of 11 states where nursing faculty make less than the average associate level registered nurse. So the other problem is a clinical placement system, a lack of access to clinical placement system and competition between our schools. And so then we led to our recommendation tools, which we'll discuss at the end of the next slide. Uh, this is our data sources. We don't just rely on our own SLDS data, which is the connected data. We bring in the national data as well, so you can see how Oregon is compared to other states. We go to the next slide. Uh, we we'll start with the national trends. So we started the study looking at the national trends in healthcare employment. And you can see the top chart is non-nursing healthcare employment, how Oregon compares to the rest of the country per capita. The bottom is nursing employment and how we compare to the rest of the country. So this quickly led us to examine what was going on in nursing in Oregon. Go to the next slide. Now, this is non-nursing healthcare graduates in the state of Oregon. We're slightly below the national median and a little bit of improvement. Let me compare this to the next slide. You can see we produce the third fewest nurses per capita in the United States when comparing all public and private institutions. The only two states we are ahead of are Alaska and Hawaii, two states that face the geographic challenges. And the problem is even more pronounced when we look at only public institutions we are dead max for nursing graduates in the country. Um, and well less than half the, the national median on nursing graduates. So we started examining specifically nursing because of this data. And you can see, um, we also examined this number of graduates per total healthcare employment in the state. Once again, the top chart would be the number of non-nursing healthcare graduates per healthcare, total healthcare employment in the state. And the bottom is nursing graduates per total healthcare employment in the state. Once again, we're the third fewest in the country. So whether you look at it per capita or per total healthcare employment, Oregon's primary deficit is in nursing. The next chart, um, these back on the regions, location of our different programs. So we started looking at the regional differences in Oregon. In the next term. Okay, this is from the uh, employment department. Our colleagues over there at the employment department provided this data for us. And what this is, is from their job vacancy surveys. And it shows that since 2017 onward, employers are no longer specifying what level of nursing degree they're looking to fill any, which suggests that we have a serious shortage in the labor market, nursing labor market in Oregon. In the next term. Now, this is all of our nursing programs in the state of Oregon, public and uh, private, and only four of our programs are accepting more than 50% of qualified applicants into their programs. The next chart. Now, where our students are coming from, you can see the, the bottom and then the mid gray color. Those are Oregon high school graduates that are also employed in the state. And then the light gray, people coming from other states that are graduating high school here, but are employed in the state prior to entering the program. And then the TO cover would be those um, students entering their nursing programs from other states. The big one you'll notice there's Treasure Valley Community College, that's our Idaho students right there. They actually have a satellite campus in Idaho. 
with this lower in school. I mean, next chart. And we can also see where are high, where are all of our nursing students coming from. What you see here is all of our schools across the country, across the state, and that they're drawing in students from their high schools. They're not bringing in students from other areas. Um, nursing education is very, very regional. Students graduate high school there, they go to college in that area, they're not moving for these programs. The you only know, exception would be Treasure Valley because of Idaho. But the majority of their students are coming from local high schools in the same region as the colleges. Go to the next slide. And then uh, afterwards, they're then employed in the same region that they attended the nursing program. Nursing students do not move. <laughs> they're not a mobile group of um, industry. They tend to graduate high school there. They go to college there. They will get employed there afterwards um, across, the, across the state. Can Once again, Clackamas is going to be an exception here. It's a lot more important. Can I ask a question? Excuse me. Um, the, the data that you have here, is this specific to associate degree nursing programs, or does this also incorporate the baccalaureate programs? This is bachelor's in both. This is bachelor's in both. Right. Um, so yeah, we, we, do, we do have the data on yeah. nurse practitioners, but there's the only location for them, so it would be in kind of useful, <laughs> useless um, chart because they're all on board with um, Okay, now we also noticed a lot of regional differences in inequities. So you can see the top chart here is just showing the, the percent of students that are coming from high schools in that region that are, are then important and then also are employed in that region. Clackamas is the only region in near Portland that is not even patterned everywhere else. The majority of students are coming from high schools in that area, and then they're being employed in that same area afterwards. Now, not every okay, oh, go back one. Not every area of Oregon has a bachelor's level nursing program. You can see the effects of that on nursing employment. This is the percent of nurses employed by degree level associate versus bachelors. And the regions without bachelor's level access have far fewer. I mean, Southwestern Oregon only about 10% of their nurses with a bachelor's degree versus Portland Metro, which is about 60% of a bachelor's level. You know, next slide. Now, this is on a per capita basis also looking at the inequities in nursing. Northwest Clackamas and Mid Valley have, and Southwestern all have the lowest number of nurses employed per capita in the, in the state. Um, and you can see the different, by the different levels of education as well. Oh, this one was not included originally in your packet. Go to the next turn. Quick question. Yes. Do you have data on the first year students and three nurses? Yes, I do. Yeah, I was just going to discuss that right here, actually, right. on this slide here. Right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we actually do. So we also examined this is outside the scope as Ben said, but some things we did examine were outside the scope first study. This is looking at our associate level registered nurses. Okay. And after they graduate, they get a job in healthcare. And how long do they stay in healthcare in the state of Oregon? Year zero is they graduated, got a job. And we can see within three to four years, we have lost one quarter of our registered, our brand new registered nursing graduates in associate level. And between 10 and 11 years, we've lost 50%. Now, racially, uh, Pacific Islanders, Native Americans, and um, African American graduates are plumbing faster than the overall. So we do real racial disparities. Um, part of the recommendations are we change the folks who look at those racial disparities. We have the data examined when we do that. And what we did notice, though, is our community colleges are accepting and graduating all ethnic groups in line with Oregon's racial breakdown. So our colleges are doing a good job of accepting the students and producing the students that community colleges are, but once they enter the workforce, we're losing our minorities faster than they're losing our majority groups. So this also could, you know, enlightens why there are fewer higher level nurses because of, of different ethnic backgrounds, because we're losing them in the workforce faster. When you say lost, they're no longer showing up in our dating work. Could have moved states or they could have left healthcare completely. Thank you. Yes. I was going to question. So we don't know if it's Oregon. We can tell that what percentage left Oregon for other industries. We can't tell. Um, they, they disappear from Oregon's data. <laughs> um, and so this is just looking at the ones that left healthcare. We could also see them took other other jobs in other industries. We could tell that. That would be that as part of this report. Have you seen a significant uh, difference between this data for the public? 
this is this seems like the same data. Yes, correct. But um, what we're talking about is essentially the same field. Well, I didn't examine that between the different locations of education. I didn't examine that. I mean, that's something we could take a look at. But if there's some difference between the private grad, private school graduate, private women and uh, some public school program graduates, yeah, we didn't have the same. So, um, yeah, so we, our report does not talk much about racial, racial inequities in the nursing programs in our, our, in our schools because they're doing a good job. <laughs> they match for these demographics. Once again, the problem is in the employment side of nursing and how many racial inequities. You know, next slide. All right, so this is all of our programs. The bottom color is how many they're currently accepting of their qualified applicants. The mid range is how many they need to accept to meet the regional job demand in their area. Dark gray is a surplus, and then these are the schools that have a shortage of qualified applicants. Not all of our schools have a surplus. So these schools on the left do have a shortage, either to keep their current market share. Once again, one school could expand more to a larger market share. But their current market shares, um, you can see Oregon Coast, Treasure Valley. Um, Sumner and Clapham. The, the, the West Coast is actually what appears to be the having the most difficulties in, in nursing education and employment in Oregon. You go to the next slide. Now we can also examine how many percent of students, uh, percent of applicants being accepted by programs and the percent of jobs in each region being filled by each program. The schools in the top left are accepting. 80 90 percent of their applicants, so they have to have a hard time expanding because there's not enough applicants. Schools at the bottom right here are taking less than 50 percent of their applicants, but producing around 70 percent of the jobs, so they have a hard time expanding. But every school here you know, theoretically could double the size of their program, they have more than enough applicants to double their program and more than enough jobs. Nursing jobs in their region to double their program capacities. Go to the next slide. So what was causing this? We, we spent a lot of time interviewing and surveying all of our colleges and our programs. So we go on with survey the data. Here's some of the basic answers. You can look it up on your slide. The answer is our faculty can't find faculty because they don't want to take a pay cut. And we have no clue to place the capacity of the programs are going to be with each other. So if you go to the next slide. So that's what they told us. We started examining well, what's wrong with Oregon's nursing faculty pay. And we see here Oregon's nursing faculty pay actually um, uh, oh, that's right. Um, that's what we registered nurses tell We have the fourth price in the country adjusted for cost of living. Okay, you often hear thin because they don't adjust for cost of living. They've already got it adjusted for cost of living. We have the fourth highest registered nursing pay. Um, and we can compare that to the total number of nurses employed in the state. As you see, the fewer nurses you have employed in the state, meaning the larger the shortage you have in the state, the more it's going to cost you in nursing salaries. Okay, go to the next slide. And then we compare that to how much our nursing faculty make. And you can see here, the average nursing salary in the state of Oregon is about $1,000 more than the average nursing faculty salary. We are one of 11 states where this is true, um, where the average nursing salary is more than the average professors make. Go to the next slide. Now our nursing faculty tend to be master's level nurses though. So they're gonna be on the top end of their earnings. So we earning potential. So we compare them to the top 25%. And you can see the top 25% of nursing registered nursing earners, we are the second highest. And we compare that to nursing faculty salaries. Without, and you can see your down rate at the bottom again. Go to the next slide. Now, nurse practitioners are masters, all graduate level nurses. Now we're comparing graduate level nurses to graduate level nurses. No state pays the equivalent. Nurse practitioners make a lot more than faculty in every state. But you can see that they're the most equivalent education and career wise. And we are the in the, in the bottom. So then we can take this data, go to the next slide, and we regress it and we can see clearly the bigger that wage gap between nursing faculty and what nurses make in the healthcare sector, the fewer students you produce. The larger this gap, the fewer students you produce. Let me go to the next slide. So we ran a path analysis. Path analysis allows to take the directionality of relationships. We can definitively tell you which direction these relationships are connected to each other. What we found is that Oregon was not producing enough, was not producing enough registered nursing graduates as a state for at least a decade. That caused nursing salary wages to rise to the, some of the highest in the country. That then caused the wage gap between our nursing faculty and our registered nurses, which has then compounded the problem and made it impossible for our programs to hire us enough nursing faculty. So we know that the cause of our of this nursing shortage in Oregon is primarily due 
to me, lack of program capacity in the organization programs is the main driver of the shortage. So you go to the next slide. So here's some of the this clinical placements in Oregon students who have to perform clinical support in nursing education. And they accept our, our colleges set up individual relationships with community hospitals to place these students. So this is the, the programs that had denials, the number of denials for both uh, individual and cohort clinical placement requests um, from 2016 through 2020. And only one program, Chemeketa, has had no, none of their clinical placement requests denied. So these students came to get access to finish up their education. We asked the programs what the cause this was. What we found is that in the uh, areas like Portland, they have a lot of competition. The programs are competing with each other and keeping each other out of hospitals. In our more rural areas, we're usually only relying on one hospital next to the college to send expanding out to other regions because they have to build these individual relationships. So go to the next slide. So this leads to our recommendations, and then we'll cover the recommendations. Thank you. Uh, so as Jesse mentioned, we had there were four recommendations in the study. We're going to hit on two. I wasn't watching how much time, so I'm not sure how how we're doing. How quick I have to go? Three minutes. I will go quick. Okay. So two recommendations here. So the first uh, to address the most pronounced problem, which is the faculty wage gap. Um, and so uh, just a quick note on both of these recommendations. Um, they're high level because uh, we're data and research experts, we're not policy experts, and we don't live in this world. So we didn't want to try to dive in and offer a specific policy proposal. What we wanted to do was say, here are the problems we see, here are the sideboards that the data tells us is important. And each of these is also focused from a state agency perspective, because that's where we live, that's our context. So it's geared at, here are the state agencies we think are key, and also acknowledging that there's a large uh, group, as evidenced by this room and why we're here today having this conversation with you, that need to be involved in these conversations. So this first one addressing this, um, this is a uh, recommendation was targeted at HEC to lead and coordinate that conversation. One of the results is today, uh, our participation in today. Um, and then the sideboards that we thought were, were really critical in the conversation and why statewide co coordination is important here. One of the things that the community colleges told us in part of the conversations is they, they said, yes, this is absolutely true. And please, please, please don't make us negotiate this individually because every program is going to make a similar case, right? Why their program also needs faculty salary raises. So we thought it was important that this conversation needs to be a state-led conversation, and we don't put that burden on the institutions to have that with their unions. Secondly, um, we also didn't want the other side effect of that would be uh, disproportionate solutions, which wouldn't actually solve the problem. What would start to happen is if one college or university solved it, raised their salary, we're not actually increasing capacity, we're just stealing capacity. And so this is the other aspect of why statewide coordination is really, really critical here is whatever solution is determined, we need to make sure that all of the institutions have access to it equally so that we're actually starting to drive up the total capacity of the state. Okay, next slide. So the second one, statewide clinical. So our recommendation here is that the Oregon State Board of Nursing lead this conversation. Um, and a couple of uh, considerations similar to uh, what I was just talking about, we felt like a statewide coordination here was important because the current uh, the current uh, situation, because of each institution is negotiating with um, uh, the, their local areas, we thought in order to really start to drive up the total capacity that the statewide coordination was really, really critical here. Um, in order to, part of what we heard too, anecdotally, we didn't have data behind this, but anecdotally what the colleges would tell us also is that this also limited student mobility. So if a student wanted to attend outside of their area, which the data showed that doesn't happen uh, a ton, but in the areas where it does, the clinicals limit their ability to go back home in order to finish their education. And because of the, the regional you know, nature of this issue, what we wanted to ensure is that we're providing maximum opportunity for the students here, which is also why we think the statewide aspect of this is really, really critical. So I know we're up at time, so I will close it there. Thank you. Um, and thank you for, for sticking to time um, again.
questions, part of the purpose of the breakout sessions will be for you to be able to ask questions. So I trust you both are going to be available during the, the working um, group sessions. Um, all of our speakers will be available. So we're going to transition now. Um, and uh, Marina, I very much appreciate, I think we all do, the questions of where is the data? Where's the data that really demonstrates uh, the gaps and the needs in equity? Um, and so part of your charge, by the way, in your working team groups is going to be, what data are we missing? What information do we need? And how do we as an MSP consortium guide the state of Oregon to get the right data to get to the right solution? So with this, I will now introduce um, uh, the information and sort of um, baseline uh, info for our final uh, working with team, and that's expanding equity and diversity. And so we're going to invite Krista Mars as well as Dr. Jeff Luck up at OSU um, to set us off. So we get 20 minutes, and Chris, I'll, I'll let you get started. I'm going like in between um, you all. Right. <laughs> You're like, so uh, next slide. So uh, this is what we'll be talking about. I'm going to go through this really quickly, these context setting plates. So, but it's basically the healthcare workforce needs assessment by a little bit of context. Next slide. So at the Oregon Health Authority, uh, we have a definition of health equity, and that's what you see at the top. And we also have a really aspirational goal to eliminate health inequities by 2030. And that sets the kind of context and framework for all of our work, including this needs assessment. Next slide. And uh, the OHA was required in the hospital 3261 in 2017 to conduct a workers needs assessment every two years. And we'll be talking about Dr. Jeff Block. We'll be talking about the 2023 version of state. Next slide. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> so I have hardly been reading my notes because it's a it's a long report. I'm going to try and just give you guys a um, really just a taste of what of the details are in the report. Is I, I'm, several questions that have come up today are ones that actually um, can be at least in part be addressed by the commission. So. So I, I just want to thank um, my colleagues, Dr. Tully, who was a principal investigator for the study, but he was not able to be here today, Dr. Veronica Urban, uh, and calls Colin Peterson and uh, Alice Kaiser. So next slide, please. So there, we, uh, you all are, are familiar with the, the range of workforce challenges that, that uh, we try to investigate in this report, the shortages uh, in multiple professions, uh, geographic maldistribution, especially between rural and urban areas in Oregon, um, the difficulty filling positions that we heard about in Gale, um, and, and of course, uh, a workforce that's less diverse than the patient population we serve. And so um, I think we saw some great data. I just want to talk about some of the you know, underlying challenges that we tried to um, examine in the report. Um, first of all, the, the increasing demand for a workforce uh, as the population of Oregon ages, Increasing demand for things like long term care uh, and public health services uh, due to uh, COVID, uh, limited education training capacity, we just heard about. Um, something I want to talk a little bit more is um, high levels of burnout and stress among the workforce, which really have increased losses of the workforce, especially during the last few years. And then outside healthcare, a number of social and economic forces in Oregon just make it more difficult to uh, recruit and retain workers to health care, high cost of living in both rural and urban areas of the state, um, and then rising wages in other industries while um, providers in Oregon have, have struggled to raise wages to competitive levels, and, and uh, as an in indus industry's uh, history of structural racism and discrimination. So next slide. So uh, Gail talked uh, about a lot of these data um, the, the plunge and then the recovery in ambulatory employment. One of the things that also happened early in the pandemic was an increase in telehealth utilization by a factor of 20. When, um, and telehealth utilization is, has dropped off, but it's, it still remains at a much higher level. So that's actually one of the um, good, um, one of the bits of good news with respect to workforce that came out of the pandemic. Um, over time, especially as the pandemic went on for more than a year, uh, burnout really increased and that uh, hit hospitals and long-term care facilities especially hard. Um, 
On the demand side, no, how demand increased throughout the pandemic and still remains high. Um, and as I was glad we heard about uh, clinical placement opportunities, one of the things we heard is that COVID made clinical placements even more difficult than we were before. So we saw um, actions like um, modifying licensing requirements, using more temporary staff, but those are all have all been sort of short-term solutions that haven't fully mitigated shortages. Next slide. So I just want to tell you briefly about the segments of the workforce that we examined. Uh, there were eight segments of the workforce in, in, in nursing. I think we, are, we already heard about the state's reliance on other states for graduates and uh, the training pipeline being too limited. In long-term care, there's just a huge shortage in retaining staff uh, because of stress and low wages, as I mentioned. Traditional health workers are um, workers who help their community um, improve their health. These workers uh, also receive low pay, and they're uh, interestingly less diverse than the population that they serve. Um, healthcare interpreters are really important for allowing people whose uh, first language is not English to inter you know, interact effectively with healthcare providers. Um, interpreters are also not compensated as well as their training would suggest, um, and there are more needed in rural areas. The oral health workforce is especially limited in um, rural areas in Oregon. And um, unfortunately, the pathway for some alter alternative um, um, providers, such as dental therapists, hasn't uh, produced as many graduates as, as it had been hoped. Um, the public health workforce actually grew during COVID, but for many years before that, the state had, uh, had great difficulty uh, in adequately funding local public health departments, and I, I, I fear that that uh, problem will continue. Um, primary care um, shortage is a problem uh, nationwide, uh, also in part due to low reimbursement rates due to, uh, with respect to specialty care uh, and high cost of medical education. And uh, Chris is going to talk about some efforts to um, state investments to mitigate that problem. And finally, uh, the Haver Health Workforce in Oregon um, was in a crisis before uh, COVID, and it just got worse, uh, both with behavioral health and substance abuse treatment. So um, our report, and we'll show the link to this at the end, has more detail about each of those workforce segments. I just want to talk about a, a couple of our uh, recommendations. Um, number one was improving the diversity of uh, providers in the greater population. We see that in almost all segments of the workforce, especially American Indian, African American, and Latino um, staff are, are in lower proportions compared to the patient population. So I think, Mara, in our report, we have some information for each um, segment of the workforce that we examined. Um, the next slide, um, I, you know, you all are here just for this reason. Uh, to increase the supply and, and improve the geographic distribution of the workforce. Um, I would um, say that in our report, we have uh, data that was provided by OHA about the relative levels of workforce shortage um, in several segments of the workforce in different parts of the state. But the, the next recommendation that we really heard a lot about was um, on the next slide is um, resiliency and burnout. Um, what we find today is that uh, six out of 10 doctors and six out of 10 nurses report being stressed and burned out. Um, and COVID tremendously exacerbated that. We don't have so much data on uh, mental health providers, but I'm sure the rates are just as high, um, if not higher. <clears throat> and so there's significant detail in our report about this, but I just want to emphasize that there's a two-pronged solution to this. This graphic is from the U.S. Surgeon General, which talks about multiple actions to take to increase resiliency um, among the workforce. One aspect is individual well-being and mental health support for workers dealing with challenging situations, um, clinical situations, as well as um, short staffing. The second is actually redesigning workplaces to be more empowering um, and more supportive. Uh, for example, team-based care, allowing providers to work at the top of their license, um, those structural um, changes uh, are often challenging for employers to implement, but can actually make a big difference uh, in recruiting workers and allowing um, workers to move up the career ladder. 
So we also had uh, several other recommendations. I really just wanted to highlight the first and last of those um, about training, education, and career pathways. That's the purpose of this group. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion sessions, hearing more about that from you all. And, and the last one about data collection. Um, we have good data in Oregon about certain things like the numbers of licensed providers, but for other aspects of the workforce, our data are relatively limited. And some of the data about um, actual vacancies and the reasons for those vacancies for particular types of positions um, are relatively limited. So uh, additional data, I think, would be especially helpful in helping to quantify the uh, needs for the kinds of positions that future ready work folks in Chris? Yeah. Is it your turn now? So this slide just shows some of the investments um, that have come from the legislature, uh, so to OHA around um, incentives to expand the behavioral health workforce. That was $80 million in the last biennium um, or last legislative session for this um, the biennium we're in right now. Um, there's a healthcare provider incentive program that's managed by the um, Clinical Supports Integration Workforce Unit I mentioned earlier. Um, that uh, it was loan repayment, child care subsidies, et cetera, um, 22.5 million. And then there's uh, another $23 million that um, goes into a program called the um, Oregon Workforce Training Opportunity, Healthy Oregon Workforce Training Opportunity, or How To Grant Program. I mean, it's been in place since 2019, and that's specifically to support programs that diversify the workforce through um, grants to community based organizations. And then future ready Oregon, obviously that we're here today um, for that, and then a few other rural medical tax credits, and then OHSU's uh, plan to diversify the number of graduates and um, by uh, thirty percent by twenty thirty. Next slide. So basically, the conclusion is we need to diversify our workforce. Um, that's that's what we wanted to make sure that you all heard today. Next slide. OHA also staffs a healthcare workforce committee. Many of you are probably familiar with that. And the committee took the healthcare workforce needs assessment recommendations and bucketed them into um, kind of prioritized, because there are a lot of them in the report, and to those that they really wanted to focus on, what that's what you see on the right hand side um, strategies to diversify the workforce, uh, wellness and resiliency, and uh, developing the workforce and retaining the workforce. And final slide. So this is the um, web page for the Healthcare Workforce Committee and then the Workforce Needs Assessment URL. And that is it. Great. Thank you. Rich. Questions? Yes, Maria. I just want to make a comment. You're going to look at the same one. We have a other program. Uh, we're working, for example, with community orientation. They did all the recruitment outreach and development to recruit Latino communities, part of which method of injury. Party with the employers provide internship plus job placement. That's my 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 bit on collaboration going to be part. I think it's all problems. In the future, collaboration is so essential. We can now work in bubbles or silos moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing, um, and I think, you know, at the Oregon Council, we were lucky to be part of the how-to grant and really trying to tie the knot between getting the right jobs in the right place. And I think that um, as a trade association, we collected an immense amount of data on our members um, around a lot of these items. And we, the how-to grant funded six uh, vocational training sites across the state of Oregon, which were in year one, which were, um, oh, yeah, our workforce partners are partnering with us. Um, to create those sustainable models. So I hope as we do this work that we kind of also survey what's out there in the community and leverage those resources, because I think we do that a lot in Oregon, at least my 26 years here in Oregon, um, working as a professional, that we we don't invest in things that are working locally um, and then they disappear because they're not sustainable. So I hope as we're working on this, that we think about that. I just want to add a quick comment. As I was sitting here looking at all the presentations and the work 
and the charge that is going to be before us and the three work groups. One of the questions that comes to mind that maybe as we move forward will be answered and addressed is with the recommendations that were in OLD's presentation about forming work groups and some of those really intersecting. How are we going to talk to the work groups that are doing similar and some of the same work? Are, are we recreating what I'm an outsider? I, I keep saying I'm an outsider, but I because I'm from Texas, but I keep re, are we recreating this? siloed way of working and the left hand is not talking to the right hand because it's all interconnected and I'm concerned just from my lens that we'll be doing some great work here and then in this example OFBN or whoever's doing that work is going to do their work and have two disjointed separate ways of addressing the issue so that's my observation <laughs> One of the things that I just want to highlight about um, this grant opportunity to the how to specifically is it doesn't dictate an outcome. And I think that that's really important is because a lot of people, especially in healthcare, um, maybe from conversations I've been able to have with them, are starting to see that an equity driven solution is often apprenticeship and bringing the apprenticeship model into how we train people so that they are paid for their labor instead of starting out with a deficit at the beginning of their career. Um, and so what I love about how to, for example, is it says, what is the outcome? What would be a solution? And so if it has to look like this, it has to be a partnership, it has to be, there's a lot of different models. And so what I love about that is we saw in the pie that only a partnership was a small piece of the pie, but that doesn't mean that's the only amount of the solutions that could be a partnership. So I really appreciate that. Making you work here. Um, just a question and then a comment. The question is uh, Will these slides be available to us electronically? Yes. I was, um, the words are really small. My eyes aren't so great. I think it's really great information. So thank you. Um, that was my hard question. I think the second thing is just to keep in mind is like on some of these things as I was listening to the, to the information that. Um, there are going to be stakeholders that are perhaps beyond this table that are going to be really integral to solving these problems. And as I was looking at some of them, you know, our, our hospitals, specifically our labor partners, are really big key to the solutions here. So how do we make sure that we're designing solutions that are ultimately going to be adopted and making sure all those voices are part of the conversation? So Jennifer, we have time for one more. Okay. <laughs> Chris, this question is actually for you, so okay. <laughs> don't run too fast. Um, Eleni, if you can go back, I think two slides to the conclusion slide. I just want to highlight something, Chris, before we move past this really quickly. Um, the three small bullets, we've talked, I think, in maybe all of the presentations today about increased compensation as a piece of the puzzle. Um, and the importance of supporting uh, retention and specifically resiliency and well being. I don't want to miss this second bullet point about unclear career pathways. Um, I, I really intend that the working group that's focused on integrated education and training responses will tackle this. And Chris, I don't know if you have more to add on that particular bullet point, but I don't know that we heard a lot about that today. I don't. So okay. you don't have to make that. And, and this is part of if Neil, oh. if Neil were here, she would, and maybe Dr. Lund. Dr. Lund. Okay, that's, <laughs> Thank you. That, that's actually a theme that this travel practice um, of the report. And so um, one of the sections I want to is to go to next. So there are there are levels of education. There are levels of education in the first couple of sections, for example, the across those levels are not clear um, and have to get in on which one of the ladders or they don't have the certain disability kind of So that would be what we would be exploring in more detail in some sections of the board. It's a and I guess I could just add something, but I can't remember if this is in the report specifically, if we just talked about it a lot in our um, work in the CSIW unit is around the pipeline. 
and really focusing earlier, right? And and focusing at high school. And so thought I'd mention that. So with that, we are going to transition. Um, we are going to give you a, a 30 minute break. Um, so um, I know you've been sitting here for, for over two hours. Thank you, first of all, maybe a round of applause for our presenters. <laughs> and now a lot of information for your brains to filter and sort and sift, right? And so that's hopefully what you're able to do a little bit over the break, but mostly in your one hour working group of the session. I, I agree with Duncan. I think it's so easy to get so overwhelmed with the magnitude of the work in this space that unless we find a way to really begin to narrow the focus, at least for now, I mean, that doesn't mean that the focus has to be narrow forever. But what are the five occupations, ten, ten occupations, or whatever it is? And then, you know, it became really obvious when you took the data what one of the barriers is for the nursing workforce. There are others, it's not the only one. But if we can pick a handful and do that work, then I do think we actually get to a point. Otherwise, it, it feels a little bit. Um, it's just too, it's too much to be having all of these conversations without finding a focus area, informing that focus area with data, developing and discussing solutions. So I just worry we're, we're going to swirl a little bit if we don't find a way to really narrow our focus. Other thoughts related? innovation focus. So how does the equity and inclusion, for example, team really get focused on the best practices and innovations that are not applied consistently in order to help inform as one example of a to-do? Yes. Um, I just think the other piece of it, um, policy in the middle, is, is exactly what you were speaking to. Um, it, I think sometimes we are mentally or structurally um, stuck in thinking about innovation, but thinking about innovation with the policy and the structures and make barriers that we have in place yeah. versus what could change to help our innovation actually be more innovative and accessible. Um, and so I think that that's, one of the things that we were talking about as far as like honing in on those, let's say our 2023 top 10 fields that we're focusing on, not saying that's all we'll ever focus on, but it's also addressing like what are some of the policy changes that can help this cyclical shift. Uh, because we've seen that even one small subject like 
surgical technician, we've been able to make some policy policy changes to at least even think about the future. And so how can we do that in some of these um, positions that we're talking about now? If I'm just glad that it's centered because it really will thrive in the future. I agree with that. I like to put that right because I think it's going to be short term and long term. And, and you can't just wait till long term to talk policy. I think you, you're going to have to talk policy as you go along, um, no matter which way we go. If we go back to the same. Short term, long term piece, but also the you know, top down, bottom up. If, you know, going after special teams or gaps by career field and function is one approach. And I think it can be done in parallel with the bottom up approach, but that's the one that lets them in and say, DNAs and see if they can And then we cause right down to each of them. You're going to find those from the bottom up perspective a lot of common barriers in the IP religion, reducing the K 12 programming, and putting in the social economic barriers so that we have to access. I think, I think we need to keep an eye on both of them because uh, getting to those K 12 and other barriers for big career adults with the shape careers now will give us the immediate containment for address all of the problems faster than that. We cover with that and then we go back and slow it. I'm just going to capture some of this and then we will um, gonna move on. But I appreciate that last comment, especially, and it reminds me of what you were bringing up repeatedly as well, which was um, especially when we are starting to try to figure out the, the skills and the pathways and the barriers that how are we how are we actually drilling all the way down to talk to workers themselves, right? And what those barriers um, might be. And so I'm hearing similar um, similar things there.